Today, we are no longer silent. Today, we have a voice. Straight talk. Israel's leader nice warns speech. the U.S. about a nuclear Iran. Immigration's human side. A young woman gives us a glimpse of the anxious wait for political action. Peaceful presence. Pope Francis encourages bishops from North Africa to set a stable example in a threatened culture. And a DC first. The Archdiocese of Washington sponsors Light the City, a one night evening of prayer. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Monday, March 2nd, 2015. Good evening from Washington. Thanks for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick with your news now. The world must not allow Iran to have nuclear weapons. That message today from Israel's prime minister, who's beginning what may be a charged visit to Washington this week. He's here lobbying for tougher restrictions on Iran's nuclear program. Wyatt Goolsby has been following the prime minister's speech today and reports from Capitol Hill. Brian, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says Iran is already arming and training terrorists. So imagine what they were to do if they were to acquire nuclear weapons. That's the key message behind his speech today and one that he's going to address to Congress tomorrow. But there's no doubt that this visit is stirring up political tension. That's the message I came to tell you today. Our alliance is sound. Our friendship is strong. And with your efforts, it will get even stronger in the years to come. Despite those assurances, it's no secret the White House and the Prime Minister are not on the same page. The President will not meet with the Israeli leader, who is set to address Congress tomorrow. Today, Netanyahu told the pro-Israel lobby group AIPAC that the two nations will weather the disagreement. My speech is not intended to show any disrespect to President Obama or the esteemed office that he holds. I have great respect for both. At the heart of the disagreement are the U.S. negotiations with Iran over their nuclear program. Netanyahu has been a harsh critic of those talks, saying Iran cannot be trusted. The administration is concerned the speech could hurt those negotiations. Secretary of State John Kerry will meet with Iran's foreign minister this week during a trip to Switzerland. Israel's security is absolutely at the forefront of all of our minds. But frankly, so is the security of all the other countries in the region. So is our security in the United States. While meeting with U.N. officials in Geneva, Secretary Kerry said no deal with Iran has been reached and no deal will be reached unless Iran is willing to make some concessions. House Speaker John Boehner invited Prime Minister Netanyahu to Congress. The White House has been critical of that decision, saying it's a breach of protocol. The prime minister also says with regards to Iran's possibility of acquiring nuclear weapons, quote, I have a moral obligation to speak up in the face of these dangers while there is still time to avert them. Meanwhile, the Obama administration is hoping to strike a deal with Iran by the end of this month. Brian. All right. Thank you. Wyatt Goolsby and Jason Isaacson is associate director of policy for the American Jewish Committee. Jason, do American Jews connect U.S. nuclear negotiations with Iran and U.S. support of Israel? Is there a a tie there for them? Yeah, sure. Well, because uh, Iran has been threatening Israel for a great many years, if you're concerned about the security of Israel, the safety of Israel, you're concerned about the strength of the U.S. relationship with Israel and the depth of the commitment to Israel's security, you have to be concerned about these negotiations, which will ultimately, um, while perhaps reducing to some degree the immediacy of the Iranian nuclear threat, will hold out, hold out the possibility that down the road, maybe not so far down the road, Iran will be able to get a bomb, and that's very, very dangerous. What is the biggest concern that Israel has specifically? Well, it's a number of concerns. First of all, of course, Iran has been supporting terrorists who have been threatening Israel uh, and bombarding Israel from the north, from Hezbollah, for, for, for many years. Um, but there's an existential danger that is posed uh, to Israel by, uh, by Iran's nuclear program. Iran has been developing uh, ballistic missiles that would be capable of carrying a nuclear device. Uh, they have clearly a military dimension of their nuclear program. While they profess that it is uh, purely civil in nature, it's clearly not. There's been so much evidence of that. Uh, and they have threatened again and again to annihilate Israel. So naturally, Israel being only a few hundred miles away um, in very easy rocket distance from Iran is quite concerned about this. The negotiations are trying to come up with a diplomatic solution to a terrible problem that we've been all facing for many years. We hope that there will be a diplomatic solution, but the way it's being framed right now, there is great concern that Iran will be left with the ability to reformulate its program after maybe holding it back a little bit, and then will again rush to a bomb. This will be an interesting week here in Washington. Indeed. 
Prime Minister Netanyahu is here. He will address a joint session of Congress. The administration isn't happy about that. In fact, uh, the president will not meet with him. How do you think that his speech to Congress could affect the U.S.-Israel alliance? You know, I really don't think it's going to have any long-term effect. There have been ups and downs in this relationship, as there are ups and downs in any relationship between friends. Uh, it's not the first time that there has been friction. But the rock-solid relationship, um, the fundamental sharing of values, is so clear. And the Prime Minister ag addressed that in a speech that he gave today. I'm sure he'll address it when he speaks on Capitol Hill. There's no question, even if there is a political controversy that's been stirred up by this speech, that the relationship is sound, is in the best interest of both countries. I expect it to move forward after this blip. I wonder how this will affect the election in Israel just a couple of weeks away. Good question. It is two weeks away, and we will know you know, when the, when, when the polls are, are closed. Um, it's, it's playing in many different ways. Obviously, the opponents of Prime Minister Netanyahu are trying to capitalize on the apparent friction between the United States and Israel. Supporters of the Prime Minister are saying this is the Prime Minister standing strong for Israel's security. Um, I, I, I am not foolish enough to make a prediction. All right. Well, let's take a look at some, some numbers that I want you to, to uh, address, if you would. Harassment of Jews has reached a seven-year high. The Pew Research shows that harassment of Jews, either by government or social groups, was found in 77 countries, up 13 percent since 2007. You spoke recently to the European Parliament about anti-Semitism. What's the crux of your message? There's a tremendous concern about the rise in anti-Semitism, violent anti-Semitism that we've seen in Europe just in the last few weeks. Uh, of course, there was the shootings. Uh, there were the shootings in Copenhagen, uh, one of which uh, targeted uh, the guard at a synagogue. There were, of course, in January, uh, uh, killings at the, uh, at the at the magazine, and and then of course also in a kosher supermarket. You go back uh, last year. Here at the at the uh, Belgian uh, Jewish Museum, uh, four people were killed. Uh, a couple of years before that, in Toulouse, uh, two, uh, three uh, sc uh, Jewish school children and a rabbi were killed. It's not the first time uh, that this has happened. It, it happened previously as well. The Jews were targeted, but especially in, in recent, uh, well, the recent year, the last year, uh, a, a, a tremendous and really disturbing increase in, in violent anti-Semitism. Governments have to do much more. Uh, there has been some, uh, there have been some very important commitments made by governments. So particularly the government of Germany, the government of France have been really outspoken, have put in place mechanisms to protect the Jewish communities. But they have to be very frank, as do all European countries, in facing what the problem is, the source of the problem, and it's radical Islamist uh, extremists who are out there um, training themselves and, and, and uh, communicating the messages of hate against, uh, against a sister minority, the Jewish minority. That has to be stopped. It has to be identified. Governments have to assure protection, and there has to be a massive de-radicalization program that has to be in the prisons, has to be in schools. It's a many-part uh, solution, but it has to be put in place. Some governments are starting. They have to do more. Very troubling for the whole world. Jason Isaacson with the uh, American Jewish Committee. Thanks so much. For Thank you, insight. Brian. We appreciate it. Some of the other stories our EWTN News Nightly team has been covering in today's world. Iraq launches a large-scale military operation to recapture Saddam Hussein's hometown from ISIS terrorists. Iranian TV reports 60 militants have been killed, 70 others have been wounded in this offensive. It's a major step in a campaign to reclaim territory in northern Iraq controlled by the Islamic State. Tikrit is one of the largest cities held by ISIS militants. It lies between Baghdad and Mosul, and controlling it would open a major supply link for future efforts to retake Mosul. The Pentagon says the U.S. is not providing air support for the offensive because the Iraqi government hasn't requested it. The Prime Minister of Iraq's Kurdistan government and Pope Francis hold a private meeting in the Papal Library. The Pope was introduced to other Kurdish officials. The leaders were expected to discuss security in northern Iraq, displaced Christians, and ways to achieve peace there. The Holy Father thanks North African church leaders for their peaceful presence in an area where freedom of conscience is threatened. Francis receives bishops from Libya, Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia who are on pilgrimage to Rome. He told them, quote, you are one of the peripheries of the world, and you are the face and the heart with which God reaches out to the people. The Pope thanked the church in Libya for the courage, loyalty, and perseverance shown by the faithful there. He called them true witnesses of the gospel. And this weekend, Pope Francis led tens of thousands in prayer for Christians and others who have been kidnapped in Syria and Iraq. Preghiamo per questi fratelli e queste sorelle che soffrono 
per la fede. Silence spread over a packed St. Peter's Square. The Pope says he wants to assure the victims of kidnappings we do, do not forget them. His plea came amid reports the Islamic State has released 19 Christians. They were among the more than 220 people the terrorists captured in Syria last week. Back here in the U.S., a federal judge blocks Nebraska's gay marriage ban today. The ruling won't take effect until next Monday. Seven same-sex couples filed a lawsuit last year challenging the state's voter-backed ban. Nebraska's attorney general's office has said it will appeal any decision blocking or overturning the ban. Well, the Los Angeles police chief says officers fatally shot a homeless man after he grabbed an officer's holster during a struggle. This cell phone video of yesterday's shooting has already been viewed by millions online. The police chief says an officer is heard in the video saying he has my gun several times. Three other officers then opened fire. The suspect was killed. The department's independent inspector general and the L.A. district attorney are investigating. Coming up, a young woman in immigration limbo struggles with the crime of her parents. And a Vatican official explains why the church focuses on the environment. Stop judging and you will never be judged. Stop condemning and you will never be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. A powerful, poignant reminder from today's Gospel, Luke chapter 6, verse 37. Thanks for joining us on this Monday in the second week of Lent, March the 2nd. I'm Brian Patrick with the EWTN News Nightly team. House Speaker John Boehner demands talks with Democrats on a long-term Homeland Security funding bill that rolls back the president's immigration policies. Jason Calvi tonight introduces us to a young woman who holds a personal stake in this political debate. She's been waiting 31 years. This is home. Why wouldn't I wait? She's asked us not to show her face. We'll call her Teresa. I, mean, I do everything I'm supposed to do. Pay taxes, don't break laws. I mean, and even that first law, I didn't break. Someone broke it for me, my parents. Teresa was two years old when her parents left Nigeria and legally came to the country 31 years ago. They overstayed their visa, and now she's waiting to come out of the shadows. The waiting almost ended in 2012 when President Obama announced DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. It granted certain young, undocumented immigrants the permission to work in the country and not be deported. But Teresa was a few days too old. It still hurts. Yeah, being in my situation, it hurts. Then last November, President Obama announced a new executive order that would have applied to her. Catholic Charities Immigration Attorney Jennifer Bibby Girth says part of the order would apply to Teresa. You have to have arrived in the United States before January 1st, 2010. Um, and in both cases, you have to have arrived before your 16th birthday. But many critics slam the president's plan. We will not stand idle as the president undermines the rule of law in our country and places lives at risk. Now a judge has temporarily blocked the president's executive order. The belief is that the program will go forward. It'll just be delayed temporarily. So once again, Teresa waits. I'm no longer an immigrant. I'm here. It's, I'm part of the fabric of my community. I'm just undocumented. In Maryland, Jason Calvi, EWTN News Nightly. Thank you, Jason. All agencies receiving federal funds to help immigrant children may soon be required to provide abortifacients and, in some cases, abortion. The U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishop warns of an HHS rule they say falls short of protecting organizations with moral objections. Access to abortion-inducing morning-after pills and abortions for minors who may be pregnant due to sexual abuse will be required starting in June. A Vatican official talks about why Pope Francis is writing an encyclical on the environment. Our concern for creation and everything environmental, ecological, is basically because we need to respect the work of God in the first place. And this work of God is just was something that was given to us as a gift to sustain and to maintain human life. So in protecting and respecting the work of God, we protect and respect what human life itself depends on. Cardinal Peter Turkson made his comments today at a news conference announcing a network of church organizations in the Amazon. It is home to the world's largest rainforest. Pope Francis says the family must be at the center of any economy. 
The Holy Father held a weekend audience with about 7,000 workers representing different sectors of Italy's workforce. He encouraged them to improve work-life balance and to help women realize fully their own vocation. He also discussed just wages that allow families to live with dignity and serenity. The Pope cited previous popes, including Benedict XVI and Leo XIII. Reflecting on today's gospel, Pope Francis says we must judge ourselves first before looking at others. In his morning homily, Pope Francis says, walking down the street, I pass by a prison and say, well, they deserve it. Yet, do you know that if it weren't for the grace of God, you would be there? Do you ever think that you are capable of doing the things that they have done even worse? Well, it's already March, but winter is hanging on for much of the U.S. Waves off Nantucket's coast are so thick with ice, they're being compared to Slurpees. This video shows the ocean waves moving beneath a layer of ice. The Secretary of Energy and Environmental Affairs says part of Massachusetts' coastline could face a long recovery process. Much of New England has been repeatedly pummeled by severe winter storms this year. And some try to make the best of the lingering winter weather. In Chicago, actor Vince Vaughn plunges into Lake Michigan's icy water. The polar plunge was a fundraiser for Special Olympics. He was led by bagpipers before taking his polar plunge. Brr. Up next, a boy trapped in his body for more than a decade is now a man sharing his incredible experience. And shining light into the pervasive darkness of the streets of our nation's capital. Here's a tweet from Pope Francis tonight. Jesus intercedes for us each day. Let us pray, Lord, have mercy on me. Intercede for me. For the EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Brian Patrick on this Monday, March 2nd. Thanks for joining us. The story of a boy trapped in his body for more than a decade remains on the New York Times bestseller list for six consecutive weeks. Ghost Boy is the story of Martin Pistorius, who at age 12 contracted a mysterious disease. He was wheelchair bound and couldn't speak for 12 years, following into a coma-like state. He finally regained consciousness and with the help of an alert caretaker, gradually regained strength and life. Martin still cannot speak, but he can communicate very well through a computer. Catherine Zeltner spoke with him by Skype about the years that he spent trapped in his own body. How did you cope during that time? Escaping my reality was difficult, but I was able to develop some coping strategies to help pass the time and basically to keep my mind busy. If there happened to be a radio on, that helped. But I also began to take note of how things changed over time. Everything from how the seasons changed to things as simple as watching a wet floor dry, watching how the sun moved across the room and how the light changed. Another favorite of mine was if there happened to be an insect of some or other kind, but even better more than one, then I could pretend they were racing each other. But by far, my most effective coping strategy was to escape into my imagination. I would literally live in my imagination. I'd have conversations with myself and other people all in my head. I'd imagine I was doing all sorts of things. I would live inside my mind, sometimes to such an extent that I became almost oblivious to my surroundings. Martin, what role did faith play in all of this? I don't know how I came to realize God. He was just always there. I don't know how to explain it really, but I always had faith that he was and still is there. I grew up in a Christian home. However, we very rarely attended church. This combined with the path my life has taken meant that I never really learned the formalities of the church. Perhaps it is because of all I have been through, I became very close to God. There were many, many times where in some sense, I felt utterly alone, even if there were people around me. However, I always seem to pause when making that statement because while a part of me experienced the extreme loneliness and isolation, another part of me always felt the presence of the Lord. Through everything I went through, I prayed for help, strength and forgiveness. I gave thanks for the blessings I had and especially for the prayers answered. Even if they were as small as someone moving my body into a different position that alleviated the pain. It is amazing what you can be grateful for. Simple things that a lot of people may not even think about like to sit or lay comfortably for a while. 
For me, God is always there, a constant companion. And yes, I believe had it not been through God's hand, I would not be where I am today. If I stop and think about everything that had to happen, and the odds of that happening then, there is no doubt in my mind that that could only have happened through divine intervention. So when people hear of your story, what do you hope they take away from it? Through everything, I've learned that everyone has a story, their own struggles, challenges and insecurities. I would tell people that there is always hope, no matter how small, to treat everyone with kindness, dignity, compassion and respect whether you think they understand or not. To never underestimate the power of the mind, the importance of love and faith, and to never stop dreaming. Martin Pistorius, thank you so much for joining us today. Your story is an inspiration. Thank you. Thank you, Martin and Catherine. There is always hope. Well, once the powerful Speaker of the House, who later ran for president, Newt Gingrich now sets his sights even higher. He is documenting sainthood with a film on the canonizations of John Paul II and John XXIII. So you have these, these two historic figures, and it was such a remarkable blessing to be at the Vatican for uh, Divine Mercy Sunday and to have the canonization of both men by Pope Francis. And uh, We were very fortunate with Citizens United to capture it in a film, and we think it, uh, it really helps people understand the importance of these two saints. The film Divine Mercy was screened at last week's Conservative Political Action Conference, or CPAC, in Maryland. Well, a movie classic premiered here in the U.S. theaters 50 years ago today. The Sound of Music, starring Julie Andrews, told the story of Austria's singing Von Trapp family. And their uh, Maria, of course, the musical won five Oscars, including Best Picture. It helped save 20th Century Fox from ruin. It made more than $110 million at the box office back then. The film inspired a live TV musical rendition that garnered high ratings in 2013. And high school and college groups have been performing The Sound of Music over and over again for many years. It's certainly uh, shown the Catholic Church in a very, very positive light as well. Well, this weekend, a group of religious and lay Catholics took their faith to the frigid streets of D.C. Mark Irons was out there with them. It's a city that buzzes with motion and glows with political power. Go in peace. But on this chilly night, a group is trying to illuminate the city in a different way. And the people holding the candles have a simple invitation. Would you like to take a moment and pray? We are evangelizing on the streets. This is living the life of the gospel, uh, sharing the joy of Jesus Christ. He wants us to pray for peace for the world, and I just wanted to share that uh, with people tonight. For the first time, the Archdiocese of Washington is sponsoring Light the City, a one-night evening of prayer. This past Saturday night, volunteers invited passers-by into St. Matthew's Cathedral. Organizer Jonathan Lewis says as Christians, we have the responsibility to meet people where they are. For many people, uh, that first step back to an encounter with Jesus Christ is going to be a simple moment of prayer. Uh, and so many people are just waiting to be invited. We just try to be there, uh, be an instrument of His grace, and then hopefully bring people to the church and allow them to be with Him in the uh, exposition of the Blessed Sacrament. Investment banker Tony Johnson got that experience. I was actually just leaving a restaurant from having dinner and I was approached by two gentlemen to come say a prayer for peace. His feeling after leaving the church? Pretty emotional, man. I probably haven't uh, prayed as much as I should, so uh, I feel really good about what I did and uh, both the gentlemen were phenomenal. So among the city lights and sometimes frenzied pace of life, the street evangelizers offer this message. Nothing brings more peace than a relationship with Jesus. Mark Irons, EWTN News Nightly. Such truth. Until tomorrow, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, watch again on YouTube. For the EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Brian Patrick. Saturday marked two years since Pope Benedict retired, so we leave you with images from that historic day.